All right, go ahead, Tyson. You're good. Okay, well, welcome everybody to the Ecology Seminar. Uh, we're very excited today to have Dr. Yvette Perfecto as our speaker. Uh, Dr. Yvette Perfecto, she was born in Puerto Rico. She uh, got her PhD from the University of Michigan. Uh, she's looking over her, her CV, you see that she has done a lot of work in a lot of places. Um, she's taught courses uh, in Northern Southern America, as well as Europe. She has done a lot of collaborative work with um, agro ecosystem type stuff in uh, especially Mexico and Puerto Rico. Uh, she's written chapters in several textbooks regarding agro ecosystems, uh, as well as authored a couple of her own books. Uh, very fun person to talk to. She, she also has a, a, an eye for that biodiversity and looking at small things like insects and um, really fun to, to listen to today. I, I'm pretty excited for this talk. Uh, go ahead, Yvette. Great, thanks, Tyson. Uh, thank you very much uh, for being here and for inviting me uh, to, to uh, give a talk about my, my research. And I guess this talk is more kind of broader overview of how I see the interaction between agriculture and conservation. And um, I, unfortunately, I wasn't able to visit Logan. I haven't been to Logan before. Uh, but I have met enough people that I kind of get a feeling. Uh, you have a great community there. Um, and maybe some other time I will be able to visit in person. Okay, let me, um, let me start uh, by just mentioning this uh, report. This is uh, ever since the Brundtland Commission published the, the report, uh, Our Common Future. This was in, in the late 1980s, in, 80, in 87, almost uh, 33 years ago. Society have been debating over the question how to produce enough food to feed the world and at the same time maintain biodiversity. Now this, this is a long standing question, both from coming from natural scientists and conservation biologists, as well as social scientists and people interested in development. In the world today, we have a variety of agricultural systems going from these very intensive industrial systems like the ones that you're seeing in this picture to diversified traditional farming systems, uh, mostly managed by family farmers like the ones that you're seeing here in these pictures. And so the question um, is, uh, as posed by many analysts, is how, how uh, what systems or combination of systems will give us the best option for producing enough food and at the same time conserving biodiversity and ecosystem functions that are associated with that biodiversity. Now, what this question ignores is that global food security is not directly linked to the global food production, but rather is determined by many important drivers. And to start with, we already produce enough food to satisfy the nutritional requirements of the world's population. Uh, this is an article that was published in 2014 in the Atlantic about a, that year's report from the International Grain Council which estimated that inventories of soy, wheat, barley, and corn were at their highest level in 30 years. And this trend has continued. No, it's not that it, it hasn't continued growing. It's slowing down a little bit, uh, mostly due to climate change, but some other factors as well. Uh, but despite uh, the fact that there has been population growth, by 2014, we were producing 17% more, 17% uh, more food per person than 30 years ago or 30 years before. Nonetheless, almost a billion people, eight, 800, more than 800 million people uh, go hungry in the world today. Uh, the real problem is that people in the world don't have sufficient land to grow their own food or income to purchase that food. And then in addition to that, you know, a third of the global cereal production goes to feed livestock. 
In 2013, for example, 45% of the corn produced in the United States went to feed livestock. Uh, uh, now, there's been a recent uh, study by FAO that estimate that livestock rely primarily on forage, forages, crop residues, and byproducts that, that are not edible by humans, if they're not uh, used by humans. Nonetheless, there's still a significant amount of grain that could be fed to humans that is going to cattle feed. And on top of all of that, uh, we are also redirecting food to feed cars. Uh, the OECD uh, FAO report in 2011 estimate that 15% of the global cereal and plant oil production, uh, as well as 30% of sugarcane production is expected to go to biofuels. Uh, and the World Bank has attributed the spike in food prices that happened in 2008 to some extent, not obviously there were a lot of other things that happened in 2008 that led to that food crisis, but uh, the World Bank attributed uh, cereal uh, for biofuel production uh, to um, a part of that price increase to, to the increase in uh, the use of cereal for biofuel production. In, in the year, in the, in the period between two, 2018 and 2019, uh, that season, almost 40% of the U.S. corn supply became ethanol feedstock. So in the U.S. is still, you know, the fact that, that a lot of that is used for, a lot of the grain uh, is used for, for biofuel. And then to all of these, we have to add the fact that a third of all the food is lost or wasted every year. This represents about a trillion dollars in food. And according to FAO, reversing this trend will prevent enough food to feed, uh, will preserve uh, enough food to feed 2 billion people, which, uh, you know, there are, that's about twice the number of undernourished people in the globe. So taking care of that problem of food production will really, uh, uh, alleviate some of the problem. And then food prices increases and instability in the price of food uh, have been attributed to speculation of food commodities. So food is not no longer just food, it's a commodity. And financial speculators now dominate the market holding over 60% of some markets compared to uh, barely 12% uh, of the market that was uh, of the of the food commodities that that was in speculation in uh, about 15 years ago, so in five years going from 2006 to 2011, uh, the financial speculation in food commodity when food commodities went from 65 billion dollars to 126 billion dollars, a huge increase. So that's adding a lot of instability to, to the food system. And even more pertinent to the issue of biodiversity is the worrisome increase in the first decade of this century, and especially after the food crisis in 2008, in what has been called land grabbing, where international investors are increasingly leasing or buying farmland in, in Africa, Asia, and Latin America uh, for food or for fuel production, mostly in large monocultural plantations like this you know, oil palm plantation that you see here. Uh, the point is that people are hungry not because there isn't enough food to eat. And so when people, when you see these reports that have been called into question that say, we need to double food production, we need to increase food production by, by 100%, uh, 200% in the, in the next 30 years for to the year, 2050, you know, if we want to feed everybody. Uh, not so, not really. Uh, people are hungry, not because there isn't enough food, but uh, basically because they're poor and they don't have uh, either the land to produce the food or the money to buy the food. Um, and a lot, uh, or ironically, I, I should say that most of the world's hungry people undernourished people live in rural areas. So these are a lot of people that don't have land, 
or have very, very small plots of land or uh, are uh, workers in, in plantations and things like that. Most of the world's hungry uh, live also in low-income countries, uh, mostly in Asia. This is in terms, in terms of numbers, no? So Asia has five, 526 million people that go hungry. And uh, these are in places like India and Bangladesh because they have such high populations. Now, if you look at percentage of people that are hungry, uh, then you're looking more into Africa and some, you know, Northern Africa, Chad, Yemen, Sudan, uh, Mozambique, Liberia, these countries, and, and including in the New World, Haiti, that have a, a high percent of people uh, that suffer from, from malnutrition and hunger. Now, uh, small farms represent 90% of all the farms, uh, but are being squeezed in uh, a quarter of the land. So what we have in the world is, you know, I show you those pictures of, of industrial type agriculture, big monocultures and all that, and then the more diversified farming systems. There, those, those farms, those small scale farmers, farms represent 90% of all the farms in the world, but they're squeezed in a quarter of the land, the agricultural land. So most of the land is actually in these huge monocultural plantations or large scale uh, production. Um, meanwhile, industrial crops continue to expand and take up even a larger proportion of the land. And here you see the trend, uh, this, this goes only to 2014, but you can see the trend in terms of production. Uh, this is of, of um, vegetable oil production. So here you have palm oil, a, a soybean, sunflower, these are the biggest one, no rapeseed, etc. And then uh, this is in terms of the acreage. You can see also the increase and this goes to 20, 2011. Again, the trend has continued to increase. Leveling off a little bit, but continue to increase. Uh, and these are four crops, soybean, rapeseed, sugarcane, and oil palm. The other thing that needs to be considered is uh, that the idea that these very large scale industrial operations are much more efficient at producing food than small and medium scale farmers is erroneous. This is something that was pointed out long, long time ago by the Indian economist and Nobel Prize winner Amartya Sen. He pointed out uh, that large scale farms are inefficient with respect to land as compared to small and medium scale farms. So when we think about efficiency, you know, there are a lot of things that you can measure efficiency. And now our measure of efficiency, usually when you, you, when you hear about these large industrial scale farms being very efficient, it's usually in terms of labor. But in terms of land, they're not more efficient. And in terms of energy, they're very inefficient. Um, and, um, and here you can see, for example, this is data from some, some time ago because FAO is not publishing this kind of aggregated data anymore. But here's some data for the countries that where the data was available. You have Ethiopia, Nigeria, Tanzania, some places in Africa, Mexico, Peru, Barbados, so America, and then Asia here. And the main thing to notice here, I'm sorry, this is so small, but the main thing to notice here is the, the downward trend. This is total production and this is acreage here or hectares basically. So as the farms get bigger, you have a, a decrease in the production for the most part, you know, that's, that's the trend. And again, Amartya Sen pointed this out a long time ago and this is actually well known in the agricultural economy, economic literature is called the inverse size productivity relationship. So the bigger the farm, the the less productive it is. Um, what is really uh, more important here is that the global industrial food system is not feeding the world. Uh, this is a report, this is this, this uh, pie chart here is based on a report by ETC, a 
using data from, uh, from the FAO uh, that estimate that small scale producers produce about 70% of the food that people actually eat. So that doesn't include the, the soy that goes into diesel or diesel fuel or the, the grain, the, the corn that goes into cattle feed or something like that. No, the, this includes the food that people actually eat. And 70% of that is produced by, uh, by, billi by billions of smallholders, 1.5 billion of smallholders. Uh, and industrial agriculture feed approximately 30%. Now, this, this, uh, you see a, a variety of numbers related to this. It depends on what you include and all that. I've seen estimates that say 50% of the of the um, of the food that people actually eat is is produced by small scale farmers, not including then the hunters uh, and gatherers and and some you know urban agriculture, etc. Uh, but but in essence, uh, what we have is that small scale farmers, in a very small proportion of the land globally, again we're talking about you know at the global scale, are producing most of the food that people are eating. And here's some examples from Latin America. This is from Brazil. And uh, in Brazil, 80% of the farms are small scale farms. And they control only 24% of the land in Brazil. But they produce 87% of the cassava, which is a very important staple in Brazil, 69% of the beans, another important stable, staple. 67% uh, of goat milk, 59% of pork, et cetera, et cetera. I know that there's, uh, they produce a lot of the food that people actually eat. Uh, this is an example from Cuba. 27% uh, of the land is in, is in small producers, in the hands of small producers, and produce 98% of all the fruits that people eat in Cuba are produced by this 27% of the land, small producers in 27% of the land, 95% of the beans, 80% of the corn, 75% of the pork, 65% of the vegetables. And finally, another example from El Salvador uh, that in 29% of the land in small scale agriculture, uh, they produce 90% of the beans, 84% of the corn, and 63% of the rice, which are the three staple crops uh, for the Salvadorian diet. So making the case here that we need more industrial agriculture to feed the world doesn't make any sense. Uh, in this map, you can see the production uh, of food versus the production of feed and fuel. The purple areas are the production of feed and fuel. Mostly in the north, uh, you know, Europe and, and the United States, and to some extent a, a Russia as well, and some, some China, um, Australia, and of course, the, the, um, this region in, in South America, mainly Brazil, Argentina, that produce a lot of soy. Uh, and then the food production. And you can see here in green, the areas where food is being produced. Fortunately, many of these small scale uh, farmers or smallholders are already using diversified farming systems that help conserve biological diversity. I don't have a lot of time to get into, you know, a lot of the studies that have been done related to diversify farming systems and biodiversity. Uh, some of my own work is related to that, but uh, these diverse systems help maintain biodiversity, not only by providing a habitat for that biodiversity, but also uh, providing a high quality matrix that allows migration of wildlife from fra forest fragment to forest fragment. So maintaining the connectivity you know, among fragments, which is extremely important for maintaining biodiversity at the landscape level. Furthermore, uh, this sector uh, has a great potential for further increasing productivity with agroecological methods. So we conducted a meta-analysis meta that included close to 300 studies comparing conventional and organic agroecological systems or low input systems uh, 
including uh, in the developing countries and in the developed countries. And we found that uh, in developing countries, food production can be increased by as much as 50% from today's level with agroecological farming systems. So there's still a lot of room for improvement and increasing the productivity of these small scale agroecological farms. Uh, oh, this, I forgot that I had this. This is the, the study that we published in 2007. Now, uh, let's talk about the relationship between agriculture and biodiversity. As I mentioned before, you know, biodiversity, uh, diverse agriculture systems can be very important for maintaining biodiversity. The problem is that the the paradigm uh, that has dominated our thinking, especially conservation biologists and conservationists thinking about the relationship between agriculture and conservation is that biodiversity, as, as soon as you convert some natural area into agriculture, you lose most of the biodiversity. So, you know, the, there a lot of the, a, a lot of the conservationists are interested in the effect that agriculture has on the loss of biodiversity, but mainly, you know, just just by the fact that it's agriculture uh, is assumed to have a negative effect on biodiversity. Uh, and the 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 reality is that not all agriculture is the same. I show you those pictures of you know the intensive monoculture. Uh, with pesticide, et cetera, and the diversified farming system. So um, the idea that most people have is that as soon as you convert, you know, this, this natural forest into more intensive, uh, into agriculture, that you basically lose biodiversity. And, and, and people tend to think about, about agriculture and biodiversity in this kind of dichotomy, no? Uh, and, it is possible that the loss of biodiversity could have a different shape, no? And we have plenty of evidence from a lot of, for the, a lot of different groups of organisms and a lot of different agricultural systems that uh, some biodiversity is lost this way. Obviously, at the intensification, in looking at an intensification gradient, oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me go back here. Looking at this intensification gradient here, obviously you have very little diversity in the most intensified systems, the monocultures with high input of pesticides, etc. And you have a lot of biodiversity in the natural habitats. No, so we that those extremes we know. There's plenty of data that show that that is true. Now, how that diversity uh, falls along that gradient is it changes depending on the system and the organisms that you're looking at. And there are a lot of, uh, of systems that, you know, where, where you're gonna see that biodiversity can be maintained even under agricultural systems, like some agroforestry systems, like, you know, the coffee system where I work, there's some coffee, coffee farms that are very, very diverse, that have uh, a lot of shade trees with a lot of diversity, high, high, um, high species richness of, of vegetation, and that helps maintain the associated biodiversity. And it's not until you get to the very intensive system with low numbers of shade trees or no shade tree whatsoever, a coffee monoculture, where you have to drop in biodiversity. So what we need to do is search for those systems that actually provide you with high biodiversity and, uh, and to some extent, uh, a high productivity as well. And there are examples of that. So biodiversity and yields are, are, and yield are not always negatively related, which is the assumption that most people make, no? That as soon, and this is certainly true, we were talking about this before, uh, this is certainly true in, uh, in the northern areas, in, in, in more developed countries where you have uh, in more industrial type agriculture, uh, conventional agriculture, there's this idea that, as, that, that there is this, this strong trade-off between yield and biodiversity. Now, this is data from the work from, uh, of Jan Cloud in, uh, I think this is in Indonesia, in, in uh, cocoa plantations, cocoa farms. And they look at nine different groups of organisms 
and none of them show a, a relationship with yield in terms of the species richness. The only one was herbaceous vegetation, which makes sense because the herbaceous vegetation is usually managed. They, you know, they weed the farms and so they eliminate the, the, the shade trees. And so in the farms that they're doing a lot of intensive management and eliminating the, the, the shade trees, I mean, the, not the shade trees, the, the herbaceous vegetation, the weeds, uh, they have higher yields. No, so there is a trade-off there with the the richness of uh, herbaceous vegetation, but none of the other organisms show any difference. And then people say, well, but you know, those are species that are uh, that live in agriculture areas and species that 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 are not that are uh, basically generalists, etc. Uh, what about maybe endemic species? And so they did the analysis for the endemic species of uh, butterflies and birds, and they found absolutely no relationship with yield, no? Um, and so what this suggests is that there are indeed systems that present situations of synergies, no? And uh, that basically, for example, you know, in a situation like this or like this, or like this, this is a general situation, we should be looking at what are these farms here doing? You know, These are farms that have high yield and high, high biodiversity. So how are these farmers managing those farms to maintain high yield and high biodiversity? Obviously those systems, um, those are the system that we, we need to promote. No? And these situations of synergies with both high levels of productivity and high levels of biodiversity uh, are being managed in a way that uh, that promote those synergies, and and you know that those are the type of systems that we should be uh, trying to emulate. Uh, the reason we have those situations of synergies is because agricultural production is highly dependent on ecosystem services, such as pest control, pollination, soil fertility, among others, and diverse agroecological systems maintain this functional diversity and ecosystem services while increasing also the resilience and minimizing environmental cost for the farmers. So um, I don't know how much, I, I forgot to put my timer, so I don't know how much time I have left, but uh, in the next part of my talk, I want to talk a little bit about biodiversity and ecosystem services, no? Um, biodiversity obviously can contribute to many ecosystem functions and services. And here today, I want to explore a little bit of those that are related to yield, pest control, pollination, and climate change. Now I, I show you before uh, uh, the data from Jean-Claude that show no relationship between yield and biodiversity. Now that doesn't mean that there's no, you know, that under any circumstances there's a relationship. That was that was an example where that that negative relationship or trade-off doesn't exist. There are examples of synergies, especially when you are doing polycultures or intercropping. Now there's a huge literature in intercropping. Uh, while it is not true that uh, the more diversity of crops you have, the highest your total yield is gonna be, uh, it is certainly true that many intercropping systems show over yielding. So show higher yields than the monocultural equivalent. And this is almost always true when you combine grasses and legumes, no? And um, in, in East and Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, farmers have been systematically increasing yields by using nitrogen fixing trees. Like here you have, you know, this is a nitrogen fixing tree, Lucina, and it's being intercropped with, uh, with corn and increasing the yield of corn. And they use the Lucina also to feed the animals, no? As forage for the animals. In Malawi uh, alone, 200, uh, I'm not sure if I have this. Yeah, I have this information here. So 200,000 families or 1.3 million people have been adopting these systems, increasing yields from 1.3 to 3.5 tons per hectare of corn. Uh, and in the process, they have improved soil quality and produced fodder for the, their livestock. 
uh, in in uh, Zambia, a system that incorporates the the natural uh, tree that grows in the savannas. There, this is a this is a tree called Fatherbia albida, and it's a legume. And the the farmers plant corn under this tree, and they have been able to double corn yields and sometimes even triple corn yields. Uh, without using synthetic fertilizers, just by the fertilization of, of the, the, the falda herbia. Uh, and here's, here's some, some data for several years in, in Zambia. Uh, and the good news is that these systems are still widely used throughout the world. Uh, not that much in the United States, although in small scale vegetable production, we see a lot of diversity. Uh, but uh, in, um, in many parts of the developing world, world we we're, we're still have a lot of these intercropping systems. Uh, so in China, for example, about 20 to 25 percent of the arable land is still in intercropping. Uh, even India, the showcase of the Green Revolution, you know, India has been very influenced by the Green Revolution, still has about 17% of the land in intercropping. And in many African com countries like Malawi and Nigeria, most of the land is still planted in multiple cropping systems. Okay, pest control, that's another way in which diversity can contribute to, uh, to enhancing the agricultural systems. Um, and it's a, an important ecosystem service of biodiversity. In a recent meta-analysis, well, not, not that recent actually, uh, this was published when in 2011 by Deborah Laterno, and there have been several other meta-analyses like this that have shown that, uh, that uh, in diverse, polycultural system, there's less, less herbivores, there are less herbivores, um, and um, well, in general, less herbivore, more natural enemies, and less plant damage than the monocultures. Here, the zero, the zero um, line uh, represent the monocultural equivalent. And one important system that I, is gaining a lot of popularity uh, one of these intercropping systems that is gaining a lot of popularity because of the pest control effect that they have is the, the so-called push-pull system. Uh, this was developed uh, in Kenya by the International Center for Insect Physiology and Ecology. And uh, it's a system to control weeds and pests, insect pests. The technique involves intercropping maize with repellent plants and planting an attractive track crop as a border. So here you have in the border, you have napier grass and it attract the pests away from the crop, from corn uh, into the, the trap crop. And then you have uh, desmodium that is planted is a nitrogen fixing plant and it repel uh, the, um, it repel the insect pests in the, the boar that attack the corn but also it makes uh, a particular weed that is a very nox noxious weed, it's a parasite of corn. And what it does is that it stimulates the germination of the, of, the, of the weed and it's called striga or striga, the weed. And it, it stimulates the germination of this weed, but then uh, it doesn't because the, because basically when, when it germinates, it needs to be close to a corn plant to be able to parasite the corn. And it's close to the desmodium and they cannot parasite the desmodium. So basically the plant germinate and dies. And so it's very effective at controlling the weed and controlling the, the main pest in, in corn. So the push-pull system has been adopted by about 75,000 smallholders in East Africa, and yields have increased from, uh, from one ton to 3.5 tons with minimal inputs. Uh, my, our own work in, in coffee, in coffee farms have shown the importance of having this diversity, uh, bird diversity, bat diversity. We did a study that showed the impact of birds and bats on the, 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 the insects in the, in the coffee farm, attacking mostly the herbivores. 
And in a study that was conducted in Jamaica and another study in, in, in Costa Rica uh, on coffee farms, uh, Matt Johnson and, and Danny Karp have estimated that birds were contributing about $310 uh, dollars per hectare through predation of the coffee berry borer, which is the main pest of, uh, of coffee, insect pest of coffee. So this is the action of, they, they call them birds, but I say it's birds and bats because the exclosures were there day, during the day and during the night. So it's birds and bats, not just birds. Uh, and uh, another study that was done in cacao, um, in cacao farms in Indonesia that show that this is the, the work by Bea Maas uh, from Germany. And she showed that basically the protection of the birds and the bats of the, uh, through pest control uh, result in 31% increase in coffee yield. Uh, and that is equivalent to $730 per hectare per year in Indonesia. And so uh, this is a lot of money for, for small scale coffee farmers or cacao farmers. And our own work in, in coffee farms show that um, shaded coffee that have a very high diversity uh, has a complex web of indirect and direct ecological interactions that are centered around a particular species that is an arboreal ant, a stick ant. I'll talk a little bit about this in my talk tomorrow. Uh, and here you can see the web of interactions. These are trade mediated indirect interactions and, and then direct direct trophic interactions among different species. And, uh, and these basically result in the autonomous, what we call the autonomous pest control of four of the main pests in coffee. The berry borer, the scale insect, coffee rust, which is a disease, uh, and the leaf miner. And so when you, when you have uh, coffee, that is intensified. So if you move along this intensification gradient, you lose a lot of biodiversity. And, and there's a lot, of, a lot of, uh, of studies that have shown the decline in biodiversity with the intensification of coffee. When you move from a system that has shade trees to a monoculture system like this, you lose, it, it would be you know, something that looks something like this, a monoculture you lose the ant, Azteca instabilis, that is connected with all of these different other organisms that are responsible for the autonomous pest control uh, of these pests in coffee. So you can lead, this can, the disappearance of this ant can lead to the potential outbreak uh, of these four species of pests in coffee. Pollination is also a very important ecosystem service. Uh, it provides a, a, the, a diverse pollination, pollinator community provides more stable and higher levels of pollination uh, services. Um, a study that was conducted by Rogers and his uh, colleagues from the University of North Carolina show an increase in seed set in high bush blueberry, for example, with, um, an increase in bee richness. And, uh, and here you can see the data with you know, the bee richness, here are the, the species groups and uh, seed set. And uh, they estimated that uh, there was an increase of $311 uh, for, of, uh, of yield per acre for each additional bee group that visited the crop. So that's, you know, a lot of people are doing this economic analysis, also putting, you know, some dollar value to the, to the amount that, uh, that that ecosystem service represent for, for the farmers. And in uh, the positive relationship between bees, species richness and fruit set has also been documented from coffee. Of course, I have a lot of coffee examples because I work in coffee. Uh, with increase of 60 to 90% in fruit set at the highest level of bee diversity. And uh, although we don't know the actual mechanism, uh, a study by Garibaldi, which those of you who work with, with pollination have probably heard about, uh, this is a big you know, study with a lot of co-authors 
uh, and they found universally positive associations of fruit set with flower visitation by wild insects in 41 crop systems worldwide. So basically native bee pollinators enhance uh, yields above and beyond the yield benefit of the honeybee. Because you, know, you can have a very effective pollinator uh, like the honeybee, but in this study, it's shown that, that having those native pollinations is also important. And finally, uh, I'll mention a little bit about uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation. You know? um, I put uh, all that under the, the subheading of resilience and diverse in resilience of diverse agroecological systems. And one of the best examples of this is the work by Eric Holt Jimenez after Hurricane Mitch in Central America. He was doing some, some study of agroecological farms and he had some comparative plots and then the hurricane happened, no? And so he, this is a, you know, a good opportunity. This was a great opportunity to see the effect of these agroecological farms on the impact of, of the hurricane. And he compared neighboring plots that were using agroecological systems with plots that were using conventional systems and was able to do document that the diverse agroecological systems were able uh, basically uh, to retain more soil retain more humidity at higher depth and suffer less from severe erosion. Uh, and then uh, there's also, again, an example from coffee, uh, the work by uh, Brenda Lynn, one of my, my former students, uh, that show that uh, high, high levels of resistance and resilience in, in coffee farms uh, where shaded trees have been shown to buffer microclimatic extremes and to reduce the effect of uh, landslides after severe storms. And, and uh, this is shown in this graph. This is a work by Stacy Fieldpot uh, that show that after Hurricane Stan in Mexico, uh, the coffee farms that suffer more landslides were those that have less shade trees. So with all these examples, I hope that I have convinced you that smallholder uh, with uh, the small farms with diverse agroecological, uh, smallholders that do diverse agroecological uh, techniques that use diverse agroecological techniques represent the solution to the dilemma of food production and biodiversity conservation. This is not uh, new, nor a very radical idea actually like, you know, 10 years ago, uh, the main this was the main conclusion of the report of the International Assessment of Agricultural Science and Technology for Development, the IAST. Uh, in 2009, they published their report. I was one of the authors of this report. Uh, this was a project that was the agricultural equivalent of the IPCC commissioned by the United Nations and brought together more than 400 uh, experts from all over the world to evaluate uh, the role of agriculture uh, in terms of uh, development. And its co-chair, Bob, Bob Watson, who was the first uh, chair of the IPCC, uh, released a report with the phrase, business as usual is not an option. Uh, basically, that was the main conclusion of the IS report 10 years, more than 10 years ago. And uh, just this year, we published uh, a, a follow-up of the IS report called Transformation of Our Food System. Uh, and uh, it synthesized, this report synthesized the result of over a dozen international assessments that have been published in the intervening decade since the IS was, was published. And um, as, a, as a result, basically, the result of, of this assessment is that too little progress has been made over the past decade, while uh, crises have worsened. The crisis of the loss of biodiversity, uh, the crisis of hunger, etc. And on the other hand, uh, we point out to some beacons of hope based on agroecological principles that have emerged all over the world, uh, mainly from the grassroots. 
that are showing that multiple uh, are showing multiple paths toward a true transformation of the food system. So at the same time that we're seeing, you know, that intensive agriculture continue, you know, its path, that more and more land is being put into this intensive, uh, agrochemically intensive monocultural plantations. Uh, at the same time, we see that more and more of the small scale farmers are turning to more agroecological practices. Now, of course, we need to do something with this, the, the industrial agricultural system. You know, we can't continue now. You know, agriculture is one of the main contributors to climate change as well. And it's these huge intensive plantations that are, that are the, the culprit. Uh, so we, we, we really need to change agriculture. Uh, but we have examples of how it can be done. Uh, 10 years ago, also, Oliver the Shooter, the special rapporteur uh, on the right to food of the United Nations, released another report that concluded that small scale farmers using agroecological techniques can double food production in entire regions within 10 years while promoting climate, uh, uh, while mitigating climate change, conserving biodiversity and alleviating rural poverty. And as I mentioned before, the good news is that millions of farmers are embracing agroecology. La Via Campesina is an umbrella organization uh, of, uh, of organizations of farmers. Uh, more than 200 million farmers all over the world uh, are members of La Via Campesina. It's the largest social movement in the world and is promoting the conservation of biodiversity through agroecology using the Campesino a Campesino methodology. Campesino a Campesino is farmer to farmer. La Via Campesina, uh, it's, it's in Spanish, no, it means the peasant way. Camp, uh, the peasants, the, the, the small scale farmers are kind of uh, trying to, to rescue the word peasant because they, it tended to have a negative connotation of poverty uh, and, you know, illiterate people. Uh, and they're rescuing that word. And in Latin America, uh, the word campesino, which is peasant, is being used more and more to signify small scale farmers. And so La Via Campesina started in Latin America and that's why they call it La Via Campesina, uh, but it's, it basically means the peasant way. And, and they're using this campesino a campesino methodology, which is basically farmer to farmer. So promoting these agroecological uh, systems by farmers, teaching other farmers, teaching the neighbors, teaching other farmers uh, how to do this kind of agriculture. Uh, they have developed the concept of food sovereignty and define, uh, the way they define food sovereignty is uh, the right of people to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and the right to define their own food and agricultural system. And so the question that uh, have trouble uh, natural and social scientists alike for more than three or four decades is being answered in the praxis, in the practice by farmers from all over the world organized around the concept of food sovereignty. And their agenda for, so for food sovereignty includes diversified agroecological systems. Today, in many areas in the global south, we are witnessing an agroecological revolution. And it is a silent revolution. You don't hear a lot about it, but it is a revolution nonetheless. And I'm going to finish uh, this, this talk with um, a quote from my favorite writer, um, Arundhati Roy. And she has this wonderful quote that say, Another world is not only possible, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Thank you very much. <laughs>